Hey everyone, this is Thatcher, and we're back at it again for episode two of my DCTL tutorial series. In today's lesson, we're going to be writing a DCTL that applies a highlight roll-off or compression or tone mapping kind of function to your image. At the same time, we're also going to cover how to use functions to better organize your code. Before we begin, you might be asking, why do we need tone mapping? What is that? Let me provide you with an example. So here we are in Resolve, and I'm going to go through a very basic color management kind of setup. Here I have a shot that was shot on a Zcam E2. And we're going to start off by doing an ACES transform using my uh, Zcam Zlog2 IDT. We'll be covering how to make IDTs for ACES transform in the next video. This is going to transform the image from Zcam Zlog2 to ACES AP0 linear. I'm then going to apply a color space transform that goes from ACES AP0 linear to Rec 709 so that it can be viewed on this display. We can see if we zoom in that there are highlights that are clipped on the talent's neck in this frame, as well as in the hair. However, if we go to the beginning of the pipeline, we can see that there is actually detail in these parts of the image, but it is getting clipped at some point during our output transform. That's because these highlights go above 100% once they are mapped into linear. And then when we map into Rec. 709, this transformation only preserves values that are between 0 and 100%. What you would do in this scenario typically is you'd go to Tone Mapping, and then you'd pick one of these options, typically DaVinci or Luminance Mapping. And that allows us to recover our highlights. The way the DaVinci Tone Mapping works is after transforming the image to a linear state, it will apply an S-shaped curve to each of the three channels. Let me demonstrate this. Now I've inserted my exposure chart DCTL just upstream of my output transform. You can see that when I pull up the output transform, and if you look in the waveform, this exposure chart hard clips over here on the right, just a couple stops above the mid-gray point. If I turn on tone mapping, and set it to DaVinci, we can see that it does indeed apply something of an S-curve here in order to roll off the highlights and make it so that we can continue to see tonality and it brings these chips down below 100%. Personally, when I look at the list of options within the tone mapping panel, I'm not super enthused by the set of parameters that are available to me. So let's make our own version of this tone mapping that is hopefully easier to understand. As you guys recall from my previous lessons, the first step in implementing a DCTL is to flesh out the math that we're trying to implement. So let's go ahead and do that now. We're going to start off with this very simple function. f of x is equal to x divided by x plus 1. Just looking at the equation, it might not be obvious what this function does, but I would like to highlight a couple properties. First, when x is equal to 0, it has a slope of 1. This means that it has a minimal impact on the shadows. When x grows towards infinity, this function asymptotically approaches 1. As a result, we can take a linear, unbounded input that is simply non-negative and map it to the 0 to 1 range. Here I've written out the same function in the Desmos graphing calculator, and you can see that it does exactly what I described. When x is equal to 0, the slope is 1, and as it grows, it asymptotically approaches this line y equals 1. In this form, however, we don't have any parameters that we can control. Ideally, I would like to specify the white point, the black point, and some kind of middle gray mapping that is maintained after the tone mapping is applied. Let's see how we could approach that. As before, let's start out with f of x is equal to x over x plus 1. We can add our own parameters into this function. Here I've written g of x is equal to a times x over x plus b plus c. This gives us three parameters that we can control. Next. I'm going to allow the user to specify four different values. I'm going to let them specify mid-gray as an input, the output that should correspond to that mid-gray input, big W, which is going to be the output white point, and big B to be the output black point. We're going to want to enforce three constraints. First, that if I put zero into this function G, I'm going to get big B, the black point specified by the user. Next, we're going to want that as x grows towards infinity, g of x approaches the white point that is specified by the user. And finally, when we plug the input mid-gray value, we should get the user-specified output mid-gray value. 
In many cases, when MI and MO are the same number, this simply says that mid-gray should be preserved. I've gone back into our graphing calculator and written out our function g of x. We can see that the slider c raises the entire graph up and down. We can therefore use this to control g of 0. Next up, we can see that the horizontal line that this graph approaches is actually equal to a plus c. If I raise a to 2, for example, then our highlights will asymptotically approach 2. And if I raise c to 0.5, then our highlights will asymptotically approach 2.5. Finally, we can see that with B, by raising it up and down, we can control how quickly the graph approaches a certain white point, as well as where a mid-gray value would map to, as we can see down here. Let's go back into our math and see if we can meet the three constraints that we were looking for. The first constraint was that g of 0 is going to be equal to the black point. By plugging 0 into this equation up here, we can see that this left term becomes 0, and then it adds c. g of 0 is equal to c. And we want c, therefore, to be equal to the black point. Now we have defined what c is. c will be equal to big B. Our second constraint is that as x approaches infinity, the graph will approach the user-specified white point, big W. We can see that when x approaches infinity, this fraction will evaluate to be 1. As a result, the limit as x approaches infinity of g of x is equal to a plus c. And there we have it. We need this to be equal to w. If we have w equals a plus c, then it follows that given c from the first constraint, that a must be equal to w minus c. Now we have decided on a value for both a and c. We'll finally use b to guarantee our mid-gray mapping. This one's a little more in-depth. We have the constraint that g of the input mid-gray value should be equal to the output mid-gray value that is also specified by the user. Let's plug in the input mid-gray value into g of x, as described up here. We get a times mi divided by mi plus b plus c, and this is going to be equal to mo. We know what mo, mi, a and C are from the previous constraints and the values provided to us by the user. B is the only unknown. As a result, we can solve this equation for B. This will bring us to this line at the bottom that B is equal to all the stuff on the right side here that we'll have to implement. What we have gathered from these three constraints is that when the user provides the input mid-gray value, output mid-gray value, the white point and the desired black point, we can choose a value of A, B, and C such that our equation satisfies all three constraints. Let's go ahead and write out a DCTL with this tone mapping function. I'm going to make a new file called DCTL tutorial to tone mapping DCTL. In this file, let's go ahead and add our transform function. Next, let's go back to my guide on how to write code. We've figured out the math, and our next step will be to write up the order of operations as pseudocode in our comments. Let's start off by fetching our parameters that we're going to need for this DCTL. Within our transform function, we'll have to compute the values of A, B, and C based off of the user-specified parameters. And then we're going to apply this function g of x, our tone mapping function, to each of the three channels that are given to us. And then we'll return the result. Now we'll go ahead and attempt to write this code. I'm going to start off by writing out our parameters. We're going to use define UI params, as discussed in the previous video. And we're going to start off with mid gray in first. We'll show it to the user as input mid gray. And we're going to make this a DCTL UI value box with a default value of 0.18. Let's do the same thing with the output mid gray. Next, we're going to set up the white point, which will have a default value of 1.0. 
and the black point. Now, once the user runs the DCTL, they'll have access to these four variables, mid gray in, mid gray out, white point, and black point. At this point, we should compute the values of A, B, and C based off of these four user parameters and this math that we specified over here on the right. We'll start off with C because it's the easiest. Next, let's do A. And finally, we'll compute B. All right, now we've computed A, B, and C, and we simply need to apply the tone mapping function to each of these three channels. I could write out this code here, A times X divided by X plus B plus C for each of the three channels, but that would become difficult to maintain. If later we decided to change our tone mapping function, but keep these parameters in some way, it would be more convenient to have this all in a single function so that we don't have to make modifications in three different lines. So let's go ahead and add another function to this DCTL. All functions begin with the keyword device. This is followed by a return type. If a function doesn't return anything, then we would use the word void as a return type. However, we'll get to an example of that later in this series. In this case, I'm going to write a function that takes in a float, such as x, and then returns another float. So I'm going to say float as the return type, and I'll call the function tone map. We're going to take x as a float as an input, and we're also going to take a, b, and c. At last, this function now has four parameters. We're going to make curly braces, and then we'll write out the contents of the function. Let's apply this tone mapping function to each of the three channels. One way we could do that would be to write code like this. We could initialize our float3 out and then reassign each value of out.x, out.y, and out.z using this tone map function. And then finally, we would return out. Let's see if this DCTL works. I'll open it up in my finder and I'll copy it into my LUT folder. Let's restart Resolve. Okay, so here I've restarted Resolve. Let's hop into Fusion so that we can read out our code values and fully determine if our code is working. I've set up essentially the same node tree that we saw earlier, but in Fusion. I've got our input zlog2 media, which goes into a transform into ACES AP0 linear. I've then got an exposure chart, which we can turn on. And we can see in the waveform that this goes well over 100%. And then I've got our output display transform to Rec. 709. Let's see if we can roll off these highlights and bring them back below 100 using our new DCTL. Now that we've loaded up the DCTL, we can see we have a problem that our image is black. Because the image is black, I know that the DCTL is successfully compiled. So this is actually a error with the logic in the code. And what I think it is, is that the black point here is set to one by default when we'd probably want it to be set to zero by default. So we can see here that we have indeed rolled off our highlights to be in the zero to one range. Additionally, we can see from this big bar here, as well as the code values written down in this bottom left corner, that as I make this toggle, the mid gray point does not change. So we have successfully implemented all the constraints. Let's take a look at what happens if we increase the black point. We can see that if we increase it to 0.1, then the black point appears to hit about 10%. If we increase or decrease the white point, we can see that at 0.7, it does appear to be approaching the 70% line. And above, it stretches out the waveform as expected. All right, let's go back into VS Code. Let's fix the default value for the black point to be zero. And let's make a couple small improvements to this DCTL. As a code quality thing, just to show you an example, we might want a version of tone mapping that takes in 
a float three and then outputs a float three. So to show you what that would look like, we'd simply write device float three, tone map, and we'll call it tone map F3 for float three. And it'll take in a float three, uh, X, A, B, and C. Let's go ahead and implement this function. We'll simply call the previous tone mapping function on each of the three values in X. Okay, now we can use our tone map F3 function instead of our previous kind of redundant code. We'll pass in the float three consisting of PR, PG, and PB. And we'll also pass in A, B, and C. Let's copy this DCTL back into our LUTs folder and see if it works. Hit reload. and it does still appear to work. Okay, before we conclude today's episode of my DCTL tutorial, I would like to highlight one important aspect of the way that I coded this up. We can see that inside our transform function, we call this function tone map F3 defined here. Tone map F3 calls the function tone map, which is defined up here. It's critical that when a function is used inside another function, it must have been defined before we actually use this function. In other words, if I took tone map here and move this down below tone map F3, when the compiler gets to these calls of tone map, it will not yet know what tone map is because it hasn't parsed the function yet. Let's go ahead and save this DCTL like this and just see what happens in our error log. I'll move it over and hit reload in resolve. We can see that it's not tone mapping. And if we go over to our logs, we can see this error, use of undeclared identifier tone map. On its own, this would be something of a very cryptic error as tone map is actually defined within the file. However, because it is defined below where it is used here, that's why this error arises. As a result, we can fix this by just scooting this back above tone map F3 copy the DCTL over to the LUTs folder, and then we'll see in Resolve that it once again works with no new errors. That concludes this episode of my DCTL tutorial. We've covered making new functions using the device keyword, followed by the return type, which can be void if your function does not return anything, the function name, and then zero or more parameters. See you guys in the next episode.